And that amen would not be as hearty as the third hour got started. What's tough about this, if, if we don't do it all tonight, there'll be people here this evening that won't be here Thursday night and next Sunday night when we proceed. And, and they'll say, well, he didn't cover this, he didn't cover that. Uh, what about this, what about that? And, and we'll cover all of it, but we need you to be here for all of it so we can, we can cover it. The, the, the church is going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's what the Bible says. The nation of Israel is not going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And if there, if there are 50 false doctrines in Christianity today, 47 of them are because people will not recognize the biblical difference between the New Testament church and the nation of Israel. And it just, just um, you just name a false doctrine, and, and that's what it is. Kingdom theology, Jehovah's Witness, uh, just one after the other. It's, it's a failure to put the church over here and Israel over here. And so we can't, even, we can't even have a discussion about who's going into the tribulation. Why anybody be silly enough to say, we're going through the tribulation, you can't even get through a power outage. If you learn anything after Hurricane Katrina, it's that Americans aren't going through seven years of great tribulation. They can't go through one week of knee-deep water, no electricity. Just, so anyway, but we can't even discuss that if we don't know and, and aren't certain biblically that the church sits over here and Israel sits over here. You run, you run the two together, everything becomes a muddled uh, mess and and so we're going to have to start in on that this evening, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you, help to you. If it's not a, it's not a blessing, it'll be a help, because you can't get your Bible right if you don't know the difference between Israel and the church. Roman Catholic Church thinks they're Israel. Presbyterian Church thinks they're Israel. Protestant denominations think they're Israel. Baptist, one Baptist church after another, uh, teaching um, uh, replacement theology. These, uh, these mega churches. Replace, uh, church replaced Israel. Then God's a big liar. Because God promised Israel a thousand things haven't come to pass. And, and so, uh, anyway, we've we, we got to start in on this uh, right now. Father, help us. Help me make these things clear. Help us to believe what the Bible says, not what somebody said it said. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the sons... Of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob became the nation of Israel. This nation was chosen by God to be His people. The nation was set apart from all other nations to be God's witnesses on this earth. Israel became a nation 1,500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, after He was born, obviously... Jesus Christ, in his adulthood, in his ministry, said, Matthew 16, 18, And upon this rock I will build my church. Now, what had been existence for 1,500 years, the nation of Israel, is not something that doesn't exist yet when Jesus walks the earth. I will build my church. The church's future... When Israel's had 15 centuries already, and, and more, 15 centuries and more. The church did not replace Israel as God's earthly people, but is the company of those who have trusted the crucified and risen Savior for the forgiveness of their sins. This body with Christ as its head is composed of countless men and women in whom the Holy Spirit dwells as a result of their regeneration. Those who comprise the nation of Israel do so on the basis of their first or physical birth, regardless of what they believe. So, no matter what denominations or commentaries say, one, the church as defined in Scripture did not exist prior to the resurrection of Jesus. Number two, the church is not Israel. 
Number three, the church is not comprised of those who were born in so-called Christian nations or baptized into so-called Christian churches or confirmed by so-called Christian ministers. Number four, the church has no land, no territory, no temple, no army. These are strictly the province of God's earthly people, Israel. Israel was one nation separated from all the other nations. They are known in the Word of God as Hebrews, Jews, the circumcision, my people. There are a few rare cases where a Gentile adopted the religion and manner of life of the Hebrews and became a proselyte to Judaism, but this does not make the Gentile an Israelite. It made him a Jewish proselyte, but it didn't make him a citizen of the nation, just a participant in their religious activities. By contrast, the church is composed of individuals gathered out of all nations, including Jews and Gentiles. Christ reconciled all believers into one body through his death upon the cross. Look at Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. Verse number 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. Hope you are. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that when ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh... Made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So there's Israel and there's Gentiles. There's the circumcision, there's the uncircumcision. Both of those, the Bible said, had to do with your flesh. Your Gentiles in the flesh, your Israel in the flesh, your circumcision in the flesh, or the uncircumcision in the flesh. That's what he's talking about. You were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make him in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now, if you were a Gentile, but you trusted Christ as your Savior, now you're a member of the body of Christ. If you were a Jew, but you trusted Christ as your Savior, you are now a member of the body of Christ. You know what that means? The body of Christ is not Gentile. The body of Christ is not Jew. It's Christ. So this idea that the church is Israel part two, or Israel plan B, is not so. You come out of Israel and into Christ. Just like you come out of Gentile and into Christ. He said, what's this got to do with the rapture? It's got plan to do with the rapture because the great tribulation is for a certain group of people. According to everywhere it's discussed in Scripture. We just got to make sure we know who our people groups are. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In her religious worship, Israel included every member of the nation whether or not they had any redeeming faith in God. Believers and unbelievers alike united in the prescribed sacrifices, feast days, and rituals. But the church is made up only of true believers in Christ Jesus. The local assembly takes in only such as are sanctified in Christ Jesus allowing participation only to those who testify to and evidence faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
what he said. Now, watch this. Passover. You got all these churches nowadays, they want to be Jews. They want to celebrate Jewish feast days and all that. Look, here's Passover. Do you want to partake in pass of Passover? Are you a circumcised Jew? Not do you believe in God, not do you trust God, not if you obeyed the scriptures, not do you live in a holy life, are you circumcised Jew? You can participate. Are you a Gentile? Then get out of here. Okay? It's, it's all a matter of flesh. It's not a matter of any relationship to God. Now, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And when you come to eat this bread or drink this cup, we don't care where you were born. When were you born again? We don't care who your earthly parents were. When did God become your father? See, the, the Passover is limited, participation limited to a physical people. The Lord's Supper is limited to a spiritual people. Now, that's true of all those feast days, all those holy days, everything else. And when the church starts trying to have holy days and feast days and special days out of the year and all that, they're trying to be Jews. They just, they just can't get away from it. Your pilgrim forefathers had a lot to do with that. They came over here, to, as Brother Chris taught in Sunday school, they came over here to establish the kingdom of heaven and to spread God's kingdom on earth. And if you're not our color and don't look like us, we got to kill you because this is Canaan land and we're driving out the Canaanites. Look, they, we can't get... i, I got to stay on track. If you think you're Israel, not the church, the weapons of your warfare are going to be carnal, not spiritual. And instead of winning people to faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to be killing people to take their land. Pretending that North America is somehow Palestine. And pretending that, that um, you know, uh, Pecots uh, and, and, and Hurons and Iroquois and Arapaho are Hivites, Jebusites, Perizzites, because us white folks are Jews. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's all that stuff goes. All right, another distinction is the fact that Israel had a God-given religious system. It's the only religion that God ever gave to any people. It was predominantly outward, formal, and ritualistic. It was a setup where a priesthood and ceremony ruled. By contrast, the true church is altogether spiritual. It has no official place of worship. It has no headquarters on earth. It has no priest class or clergy. It has no special days. It is entirely separate from civil and secular authority. Unless you're a Protestant or a Catholic. We don't have a headquarters. We don't have a hierarchy. We're not trying to take over the government. The only thing God told us to pray regarding government is, God, please, make them leave us alone. Where these things are introduced into a congregation or denomination, they are done so by men who can't discern between Israel and the church. In the true church and its representative assemblies, the person of Christ, who is the substance, replaces the shadow of ceremonialism. Another distinction is that Israel was God's earthly people during the Old Testament history, but they continue to be His earthly people even though they are now scattered. And they shall yet be His earthly people when He returns to earth and they dwell with Him as His redeemed nation. Their earthly character and destiny is mentioned hundreds of times in scriptures too numerous to cover tonight. The church is ever set forth as a heavenly body. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. You want know God promised that Jew if he kept the law? No diseases, no enemies, prosperity and long life in the land. So that's what he promised us. No, you've been listening to TV preachers and charismatics stealing stuff from the Jews. Ephesians 1, verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in 
heavenly places in Christ. Are you blessed down here? Well, that's fringe benefits. They weren't promised. What you were promised are spiritual blessings in heaven, not material blessings on earth. Now, if you want to get material blessings on earth, write a book about the prayer of Jabez or conquering land or naming and claiming it. And and professing Christians will pay you to steal promises for them and, and try and get them to live like Jews in the promised land instead of Christians in America. Well, what's the difference? See, that's what we're up against. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. You know what God promised Abraham? The land from the Nile to the Euphrates and north into the mountains of Turkey. Wherever you set your foot, remember it, they crossed Jordan, they went, they took Jericho, then they took Ai, then they took this, then they took that, then they divided up that entire land, it's their land. When, did, when was that land grant transferred to the church? Never. When did that territory become headquartered in Rome, not in Jerusalem? Never. Now, now watch First Peter, First Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You are saved people's inheritance is heaven. It's not on earth. There will be no earthly battle fought by Jesus to secure our inheritance. There will be no bloodshed, there will be no sword drawn, there will be no bullets fired to secure our inheritance. What we're going to have to do to get our inheritance is leave this world. That's where our inheritance is. Jesus is going to have to come back to this earth and wage war to secure Israel's inheritance which is a piece of land much disputed uh, over the last several thousand years. There's no dispute about our land. Not one foot of ground in heaven has ever fallen into enemy hands. Well, you know, in that tribulation, going to be war and blood and guts and blood flowing, highs, rains, horse and prime law. Yeah, you know why? Because there's enemies in the land promised to God's earthly people. And he's going to have to come back and fight for them and get rid of their enemies so they can enjoy their inheritance. You know how he secured our inheritance? When he rose from the dead, he triumphed over principalities and powers and made a spoil of them, showing openly that he is Lord of all. And having cleared the way between here and the Father's house, he's going to come back and get us and escort us in without one bit of opposition. Praise the Lord. That's our, that's our promised inheritance. Now, the Bible calls Israel the bride of Jehovah. And that calls people a whole lot of problem. Because they say, aren't we the bride of Christ? I hope, I hope, young lady, I hope you are not married to both your father and your husband. That'd be creepy in any culture. The church is not the bride of God the Father. It's the bride of the Son. The nation of Israel is the bride of God the Father. And if you confuse the two, you're going to be confused. (laughs) Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62. We can't possibly be reading about the bride of Christ here because Christ has not even begun to form his church. In fact, he hadn't even uh, become man and so, so forth. Isaiah 62, verse 1. Isaiah 62, 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest 
until the righteousness go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof, righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thy land, uh, thou shalt be called Hephzibah and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee and thy land shall be married. What are we talking about here? We're talking about a piece of land that belonged to God, that was forsaken by God, that's going to be reclaimed by God one day. Can anybody remember those verses in the New Testament about God forsaking His church? Oh, no, wait. I believe He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Israel can't be the church. The church can't be Israel. God forsook one group, and the other group He promised to never forsake. Now look at verse 5. For, as a young man marrieth a virgin... So shall thy sons marry thee, and as as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall God rejoice over thee. You say, I want to see it more clearly. Isaiah 50. Isaiah chapter 50. Thus saith the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have ye sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. You know what God said to Israel? Your sins became so unbearable, I divorced you. That's what he said. Now, you know what you you are? Jesus Christ said to all of you that are saved, to love your wives as Christ loved the church. How about that? Where do you find any room in there for putting her away? It's not there. In fact, it's forbidden you. You know why? Because we as saved people in our personal lives are not manifesting to the world the relationship God had with an earthly people in the Old Testament, but a relationship the Son of God has with a heavenly people in the New Testament. Two different relationships. Now, look at Isaiah Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. We can't read the whole book of Hosea tonight. When you, when you get home, you ought to read it. The whole, the whole story is about... God having a man get tied up with a, with a rotten woman and then putting that woman away and then seeking and winning her and bringing her back. And it's God the Father's relationship with the nation of Israel. There's nothing like that in the New Testament. You couldn't find anything resembling Hosea in the New Testament. Isaiah 54, verse number 4. Fear not. For thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, as a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. What about that? God the Father picks one nation out of all the nations on this earth, the nation of Israel, and He joins Himself to them. They are wed as a a bridegroom and a bride, as a husband and a wife. And then the Lord, according to the law, finds such uncleanness and such perverseness in her that He puts her away. And while she is Put away by her husband, she suffers 
terribly. But he still loves her. He never took another wife. He never replaced her with another wife. And in the end of days, when all that trouble is over, the love that he always had for her wins out. And he goes and rescues that woman, cleans her up, drives away those that had been his rivals for her hand, and blesses her forever. It's a beautiful story of of unending love, of heartbreak, of restoration. It's a beautiful story. You couldn't find anything like that from Romans through Jude if you looked all night long because it's not there. You know what Jesus Christ does for His bride? He purifies. He cleanses. He sees a spot. He washes it out. He sees a wrinkle. He irons it out. He sees a fault or a defect. He lays down His life for His bride. He nourishes her. He cherishes her. He strengthens her. He he builds her up. And He says, you know what? What, Whatever happens, you can count on this. I'm not leaving. Whatever happens, you count on this. I'm not putting you away. You can't make Israel the church and the church Israel. Their origin is different. Their promises are different. Their relationships are different. Their future is different. Two totally different groups of people. Now, let's come to the New Testament and take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The book doesn't mention Jerusalem, as far as I know. The book doesn't mention land, as far as I know. The book doesn't mention law-keeping. There's what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse number 1. Would to God, ye could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste, Virgin to Christ. How about that? Did you know that... Now, New Testament. You know Mary and Joseph were espoused? And though they had not yet been joined as husband and wife, she's called his wife. He's called her husband. Because the agreement that they entered into in their espousals was till death, unless fornication, adultery should be found. Which is why it was such a, a, a big deal when Mary's with a with, with child and Joseph was going to put her away, because that was the one thing that could end the espousal. And the Lord came down and said, no, no, it's, that's, it's a one-time thing here, Joseph. Just trust me. That's a different kind of baby there. No Roman soldier, no fornication, none of that. Okay? Now... Here's what's really great about this. This verse about I've espoused you as a chaste virgin to Christ, it's not written to the Philippians. It's not written to Thessalonians. It's written to the big giant mess of a church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 2, you guys are completely out of line. 1 Corinthians 3, you guys are completely carnal. 1 Corinthians 4, you guys have got, you've got more division in that church I've ever seen. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you've got immorality in that church. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you're suing each other in courts of law. 1 Corinthians, every chapter in that book is whack, 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 whack. You guys are a mess. But when I'm through with you, You'll be as pure as the day you were born. When I'm through with you, you'll be as clean as new fallen snow. Now, does that sound like what you just read in Isaiah? In the Old Testament, God the Father takes His bride and forsakes her and puts her through tribulation for for centuries and finally great tribulation... 
because she has so shamed him and so dishonored him and so displeased him, and only because of his perfect love and the promises that he made is he going to come back in the end and rescue her from the mess she made out of her life. You know what Jesus Christ does for his bride? Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I did that. Just another chance for me to help you. Just another opportunity for me to work my wonders in you. Just, just a, a, one more time that I can be a blessing to you, my bride. Now, if you can't see a difference in that, you're not looking. You're not looking. That, that's a totally different relationship. Now, let me ask you something. What, without reading any more verses. Does the New Testament relationship of the church and Jesus Christ, does it sound like we're headed for seven years of terrible punishment if we mess up? Doesn't look that way, not yet, doesn't look like that way, that way just yet. But maybe we'll find something here in Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. Well, you know, I think the church got to go through tribulation, be purified. If the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't purify you, running from the devil ain't going to make you clean. If the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost didn't clean you up, hiding in the woods in your, in your camper with tin foil on the top so the satellites can't see you, that ain't going to fix you. Good idea. It won't work there. They put that GPS in you when they when you're pumping gas that day. Ephesians five, how to do that? Oh, it's, they got all kinds of tricks. Ephesians five, verse. Well, we're in the neighborhood. Let's just read it. Verse twenty-two. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You know how many men be here tonight if their wives didn't hate my guts. You think I'm kidding? I'm not kidding. Where's so and so? Where's <laughs> he's doing what he's told? <laughs> Mama ain't happy. Ain't nobody happy, except in my home. That's what, I, I, no problem. <laughs> Verse twenty-three. For the husband is the <clears throat> head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is. <laughs> <laughs> Subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything. We're not going back to that church. <laughs> husbands, love your wives. By the time I say that, she's already so mad she don't even hear it. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, gentlemen. The fact that you married her isn't the end of your duty. Christ took the church to be his bride, and that was just the beginning of his ministry and service toward her. See? That he might sanctify, so it wasn't sanctified till he went to work on it, and cleanse it, so it wasn't cleansed till he went to work on it, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, so ought men to love their wives their own bodies. He loveth his wife, loveth himself. For no man ever yet hate his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. What is a man supposed to do? Nourish and cherish his wife and protect her from all harm. Now, where, how do you read that and then teach that Jesus Christ is going to drag his wife through seven years of hell on earth? Because she's been a bad girl. And you can't give me any other reason. I've not heard any other. That, that's what, well, you know, the church, that's, that's not pure. She's not clean. She's got, so you got to go through tribulation, get her cleaned up. Is that what Jesus taught a husband to do? If your wife isn't clean, if your wife isn't righteous, if your wife and everything she's supposed to be, go find a bunch of devils out of hell and let them torment her for seven years. And that'll make her love you finally. That is not consistent with the relationship of the church to Jesus Christ. Verse 31, For this cause shall man leave his father and mother, 
No, really. <laughs> and should be joined unto his wife, and they too should be one flesh. That threefold cord in the Bible, it's you and her and Jesus, not you and her and your mom. <laughs> this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. How about that? All right, Hebrews 13, 5. Hebrews 13, 5. And then I'm going to ask you something. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So, simple question. Is Jesus Christ going to come down off his throne to this earth and go through the great tribulation? No. No then neither is his bride going to go through the great tribulation. He is not going to forsake and abandon the woman he loves to be defiled and tormented and harmed by the devil so she'll start behaving. You know what Romans says? Romans says, to Christians now, Christians, not to unsaved Jews, unsaved people, you've got to hit them in the head, it's the only thing they understand. Say people got a Holy Spirit inside. You know what he said? The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You would not repent if God punished you. You will only repent when you realize, how am I treating God so rotten when he treats me so well? That's what makes you repent. Look, you, uh, preacher preach against sin all day and all night until you fall in love with the Lord it's just an aggravation to you. It's just a grief to you. You fall in love with Jesus, what you're doing wrong will become the grief to you. Not the preaching against it. Okay, so that's that. The distinction between Israel and the church is so obvious that no serious reader of Scripture can fail to see them. Israel occupied the center stage in the Old Testament where the church is unknown, save in types and shadows and prophecies. The church fills the picture in the New Testament with Israelites seen in need of salvation through Jesus Christ and the nation coming back into view only in Revelation after the departure of the church. The church is not a glorified or improved Israel, but a contrast to the nation whose sin and failure culminating in their rejection and the crucifixion of a Messiah and King has resulted in their being set aside until the church age runs its course. Romans 9 through 11 and Acts 15. We can't read four chapters here tonight. Just go and read it. Acts 15. In this day, God is gathering out of this world a people redeemed by Christ's precious blood. These saved men and women from all nationalities and races are called His body, the church. And Christ is the head thereof. When the church is taken home to heaven, we don't have a home in earth. Our home's in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. The head of our body is in heaven. Our promises are in heaven. Our rewards are in heaven. Our life is in heaven. When the church is taken home to heaven, God will once more take up His dealings with His earthly people Israel, a remnant of which will be saved and brought alive through the terrible time of tribulation that awaits them. They should be called, as they are now, the Father's bride here on earth. The Father's bride, that is her future. She will enjoy this happy conclusion when Christ returns to establish His rule on the throne of David at Jerusalem. Okay, a sample. Romans 11. Romans 11. We can't read all the chapters. We'll give you a sample. Romans 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. 
And so all Israel shall be saved, as is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant of them, when I shall take away their sins. When is, when is God going to take away Israel's sins? When he comes back to Zion. That's what you just read that. Looking at me kind of, kind of fuzzy there. When is God going to take away Israel's sins? When he comes back to Zion. Whose sins will he take away when he comes back to Zion? Not every Jew from Abraham to the second coming. Those who are alive will have their sins forgiven. Why? They will look on me whom they have pierced. They will mourn as one mourneth for an only son. The spirit of grace and supplication will cause them to call on the name of the Lord. Not every Jew is ever born being saved. He that endures to the end shall be saved. In a chapter written only to Jews. And there's their salvation right there. Now what? Look, look, read the next verse. As concerning the gospel. Did you get saved by believing the gospel? What is the gospel? Christ died for our sins and was buried and the third day rose again. Isn't that the gospel? How many of you believe that gospel? When you believed it, did the Lord take away your sins? Well, there's somebody here whose sins don't get taken away until he comes back and stands on this earth. And there's somebody here who had their take, sins taken away when they believed the gospel. Which one are you? And why do you let people teach you that the church is Israel? Or that Israel's the church? Or, or, or... Now watch this thing. As concerning the gospel, they... And so all Israel shall be saved. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Now how can that be the church? You can't be an enemy of the gospel and be saved. We got saved people over here and we got enemies of the gospel over here. Now who are the enemies of the gospel? Well, in the Bible, it just said they're Israel. What does he call Israel? Finish the verse. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the fathers. Fathers. Not capital F, God the Father. Fathers' sake. God promised Abraham. God promised Isaac. God promised Jacob. And here he comes to honor those promises to his elect... Not the church. So you know what Presbyterians teach who think that Israel is the church? And you know what Baptists teach who've been influenced by Presbyterians, not the Bible? We're the elect. Don't run around saying you're the elect when the elect are the enemies of the gospel. Here's the gospel. Here's the promises God made to the fathers. Here's the church made up of people who believe the gospel. Here's the nation of Israel made up of people who one day, if any of them stay alive long enough to enjoy it, will receive the promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now you show me the verse where God told Abraham, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. You show me the verse where God told Isaac, trust in the Lord, uh, you know, uh, whosoever's called upon the name of the Lord should be saved. He didn't promise them that. He said the border starts here and it runs over there and it runs up there and all the land in between, it'll flow with milk and honey and it'll, it'll, the one, one fruitful season overtake another and no enemies will come in here and kill you and your children live a thousand years and, and you, you old men will be, you'll be, uh, centuries old. Where you get it? Where's, where's your promise? You don't have a promise like that. You believe the gospel. Your hope is to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, not to live seven hundred years. Your hope is to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall you ever be with the Lord. Your hope is not, man. He's going to come back, and kill all the Arabs, and give us our land. That's not your hope. 
You try to witness to a Jew and tell him about going to heaven, he don't care about going to heaven. He's got no interest in going to heaven. They don't, they don't say, I've been over there. They don't, they don't stand in Jerusalem and sing in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. They stand there and sing, never again will we leave this city. Never again will we leave this land. Never again, never again will we be scattered. Their hope is on this earth. And because of it, they, they make themselves enemies of the gospel. Have you not read the book of Acts? Here goes the church into a city. And who comes to try and drive them out? The Jews! Here, go, here, goes, here goes Paul over here. Who's, who's throwing rocks at him? Who's having him arrested? The Jews! Here's some people get saved. Who's coming in trying to mess their church up? The Jews! They're enemies of the gospel! But God's made them some promises, and they're going to be fulfilled. If you don't, if you don't understand the difference between Israel and the church, you can't get anything in this Bible. You can get saved, but you want to you want to understand this book? You better you better put the church over here and Israel over there and the gospel over here and the election over there and never the twain shall meet. We'll pass here and there. We'll say hello and shake hands now and again. How can the saints come back with Christ at his second coming to deliver Israel if we are Israel? How can we come back with Christ at his second coming to deliver Israel if we're here with them? We got to be somewhere else to come back to their rescue. We got to be somebody else to come back to their rescue. We'll talk about all that in weeks to come. Acts 15. Acts chapter 15. Acts 15. And verse number 13. Here's big controversy. Jews got saved. Gentiles got saved. Now, who has to keep the law? The Gentiles have to keep the law now that they're saved? See, look. You got no New Testament. You got no New Testament. Acts 15, there's no New Testament. So all these Jews that have gotten saved, they've been taught their entire life to keep the law. And they've been taught they're God's chosen people and God works through them and they're the number one top uh, people on the earth and all that. And so now these Gentiles are getting saved and it took some convincing to convince the Jews they can even, Gentiles could even be saved, but now they know they're getting saved and now they're trying to make them keep the law because God gave us the law and the law is the word of God and the law governs. And the church meets in Acts 15 and the Holy Spirit says, no law for any member of the church. This isn't Israel part two. It isn't Jew extended. It's a whole new thing. And to this day, you got to search and search and search and search to find one church that isn't stuck in Acts 14. Well, don't you think we got to keep the dietary laws? No. Well, don't you think we're supposed to uh, meet on the Sabbath day? Of course not. Well, you know, I'm growing a beard. because God. If you want to grow a beard, grow a beard. But don't do it because you want to be a Nazarite. You know, like Jesus. was a, He wasn't a Nazarite. He was a Nazarene. Daytona, Deltona. D-Land, Deltona. They're not the same. They sound the same. They're not two different places. All right, verse 13. Acts 15, 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this. Okay, so at the start, start a New Testament church, God, he's already got a people, but now he's getting a people that weren't a people. And what do they get? They don't get his land. They don't get his temple. They don't get his sacrifices. They get his name. A people for his name. See that? After this, 
I will return and build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God are all his works, not yours, from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. What's the trouble they're talking about? Making them keep the law. Now look what he said. Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, Judges, that's all Israel. First and second kings, who's kings? First second chronicles, who's chronicles? Come on. That's not the whole of presidents. That's the records of God's dealings with Israel. And the only time Babylon's mentioned is when they come bump up against Israel. The only time Chaldeans are mentioned, come up against Israel. Persia, come up against... Uh, the whole thing's Israel. Then the Lord Christ dies, He's buried, He rises again. And, and Acts 15, James the Apostle says, God from the first. So we had a new start. Not a continuation of something old, a new start. Genesis 1, God's not calling a people out of the Gentiles to His name. Genesis 12, God's not calling people out of the Gentiles to His name. When He says at the first, that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the saving of souls through the finished work of Christ. That's when that started. And He's, and he's gathering together a people unto His name. And then what He say? After that... I'm going to turn again and start dealing with who? Nation of Israel. Now, you know what that means? If there's a seven-year time in the future called the time of Jacob's trouble, then it's after that which started the first. What started first? Building a church. Well, after that, we're going to do Jew again. If 70 weeks are appointed to Daniel's people, that's not Americans. It's going to be after that. Look, all this arguing about who's going through tribulation and church and tribulation, all that, all, every bit of that is somebody that won't put Gentiles here, Jews here, church here. You start mixing them up, then you mix everything up. God doesn't mix things up. God told us rightly divide the word. Put this here, put this here, put this here. If you don't, you don't divide it up, you're going to be teaching saved people. They can lose their salvation if they do something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you get that from? Well, there's all these verses where if the Jews don't keep the law, they get cast out of the kingdom. Yeah, what's that got to do with anything? I'm not in a kingdom, and I'm not a Jew, and I'm not under the law, and I never was under the law. So why are you showing me those verses to threaten me with Christ breaking His promise to never leave me nor forsake me? I'm not the Old Testament bride of Jehovah. I'm the New Testament espoused virgin bride of Jesus Christ. I think they're the same. Well, a lot of people think a lot of things, but we want to go by the Bible. So, you know, when you talk, you always sound like you... I know, I know. It's just how I talk. How do you talk? You talk how you talk, I talk how I talk. You sound like you're aggravated. I am aggravated. Something God settled... In 53 A.D. Is still plaguing the churches throughout our community. That doesn't, that doesn't bother you? That ought to bother you. Oh, my father, the priest. Where'd you get that from? My father, the priest, is offering a sacrifice on the altar. Roman Catholic Church. How about Roman Catholic fake Jew? That's not Christianity. That's a bunch of old... Where'd you get those robes from? Aaron. Where'd you get that incense from? Leviticus. Where'd you get that altar and that sacrifice from? Deuteronomy. That's not Christianity. Oh. 
As Israel's origin, character, destiny, worship, etc. is so clearly different from that of the church, so is also its hope for the future. There is a marked difference in the Word of God between the coming of Christ for His church and His coming to Israel. The future of the church is quite distinct in Scripture. Her destiny rests in the return of Christ to take her away from a world of sin. This coming of Christ for the church is spoken of in Scripture as that blessed hope. It is often spoken of as the rapture by believers, the return of Christ to Israel, at which time He will also judge the world for its wickedness, is known as His appearing or His revelation. I'm going to read you this tonight, and then Thursday night we'll run all the references, okay? Lord, Lord willing, Thursday night we'll run the references. Let me read this to you tonight, and then Thursday night we'll run the references. Twelve undeniable differences between the rapture and the second coming. Number one, at the blessed hope, the Lord Jesus Christ comes for His saints, John 14, 3, at His appearing, He comes with His saints, Colossians 4, 4. They couldn't possibly be the same event. You can't come for somebody and come with somebody at the same time. Number two, the blessed hope is a secret coming as far as Scripture indicates. No mention of anyone seeing it is given. But His appearing is public. Every eye shall see Him. We're going to leave in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Won't be photographed, won't be filmed, won't be observed, won't cause, won't cause any... Oh! <laughs> None of that. None of that. But second coming, every... Revelation 1, 7, every eye shall see. Him. We'll, we'll read it. We'll read all these. At the blessed hope, the believers will meet their Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians four sixteen. At His appearing, Christ will set foot on the earth. That's different. At the blessed hope, the Lord gathers saints to Himself, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. But at His appearing, He gathers Israel by means of angels, Matthew 24.31. No mention is made of any signs to prepare people for the coming of Christ for His church, but many signs accompany His public coming at His appearing. Number six, at the blessed hope, there will be a resurrection of all the dead in Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. At His appearing, there is not a hint of such a resurrection. Not there. Number seven, the blessed hope holds out a marvelous transformation of the bodies of believers. We will be changed into His likeness and receive a glorious body like His, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. This was something altogether new and would not be anticipated by anyone reading the Old Testament. But it is appearing there is no suggestion of any physical changes made in the bodies of the people on the earth because there is none. The physical changes taking place at His appearing will be to the creation as a whole, with a large portion of the Genesis 3 curse being lifted, but the bodies of the people who live through the tribulation are not going to be glorified. You know, we, we just can't read all this tonight. You know people are going to die during the millennium? You know, that they're, they're, they're going to live a while, live longer than they do now. They're going to die. Well, we're not going to die. Not after the rapture. We got glorified bodies. Well, if the rapture and the second coming are the same, everybody down here is going to have a glorified body when the Lord gets back. Who's going to die? Number eight, the blessed hope pictures Christ coming under the figure of the rising of the morning star. Revelation twenty two sixteen. His appearing, second coming, is recorded as the rising of the sun. Malachi 4, verse 6. The morning star comes up in the sky an hour, two hours, depending on the time of the year, where you are on earth, and then, then sometime later, up comes the sun. Christ coming back to this earth, it's sunrise in the morning. Second Samuel 23, Malachi 4, Psalm 19. What's the church looking for? He said, I am the bright and morning star. That comes for sunrise. Praise God. At the blessed hope, the, uh, the blessed hope is set 
before the believer as a real source of comfort. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What comfort could there possibly be if one would have to experience the fearful outpouring of wrath known as the Great Tribulation? Good news, everybody. In just a few days, the vile judgments are going to be poured out. Oh, thank you. I needed those comforting words. Oh, you want some real comfort? After that, there's going to be 14 more judgments. Thank you. You know, I was a little troubled and upset till you told me that. But now, now I just, I can face tomorrow. Because he's wrath, I can face tomorrow. That's not comforting. The Bible said the coming of the Lord is a comfort. Right now, right now. Whoever reads 1 Thessalonians 4, he said, comfort one another with these words. Now you could say, well, you know what? The, I tell you, seven years into that thing, you're gonna, you're gonna, if I told you the Lord was coming, it'd be, yeah, but that's not what he said. He said, tell Christians to be comforted in knowing the Lord is coming. That's no comfort. If I'm going through worldwide forest fires and poison water and creatures out of the bottomless pit with stings in their tails, torment me for nine months before he gets here. No, thank you. At the Blessed Hope, Christ delivers us from wrath. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 The Great Tribulation is defined as the time of wrath. Revelation 19. Now, it can't be, but he can't deliver you from wrath and then drag you through it. it. Both can't be true. At the blessed hope, our Lord descends from heaven with a shout, and we are caught up to meet him in the air. At his appearing, he is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. No angels are mentioned at the time of the rapture, but at his appearing, he is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. That doesn't happen at the rapture. Well, the second coming. Number 12, at the blessed hope, Christ takes his saints out and leaves the sinners behind. First Thessalonians 4, Revelation 20. Revelation 20 declares that the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years are fulfilled, but at his appearing, the reverse takes place. Our Lord will take sinners out of the earth and leave saints. Matthew 13. We can't read them. We can't read them all. Matthew 13, here's what it says. The Lord comes, His angels are with Him. The angels gather up all the people who are an offense to the Lord because they're not fit for His kingdom. And He throws, he throws them, the bodies, the, the, the people. He, he gathers up these people. He throws them in a furnace of fire. They're executed. And then their souls wake up in hell. The rapture the saints are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The unbelievers left behind. It's completely different. In one, the good guys go and the bad guys stay. In the other, the bad guys go and the good guys stay. They can't be the same. And it can't happen at the same time. We'd be running into each other on the way up and the way down, the way in, the way out. It'd be, be just chaos. So, that's a third of it. And we haven't run the references. So, 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 and here's the answer to that. Well, I just think the church going through the tribulation. That's not enough of an answer. For three solid hours of Bible. In fact, you heard some guy say something on TV that made sense to you. I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm not. People go to church all their life and don't hear enough Bible while they're there. To know the difference between a Mass and the Lord's Supper. So, and, and when you try to teach them, oh, he's just so critical. He's just so critical of everybody's religion. I'm not. The Bible is. The Bible is. And the reason your pastor is never critical is because he avoids most of the Bible. How you teach this book? Come on, we just, we just spent an hour, a little over, little over an hour in the Bible. How could you teach that and not be critical? 
Because when you look at that and you say, well, well, how are these people teaching that, you know, we're, we're, that America is Israel and white people are Israel and the church is Israel? And how do they teach? Because they know nobody's going to look in the book to see if they're telling the truth or not. They just not, you know, they just either nod their head or they're playing Candy Crush on their phone or they're daydreaming about how they're gonna, what they're going to do when they get to work tomorrow. And they're not paying any attention. They're just hanging on to the next fellowship dinner. <laughs> and you come in here and start learning the Bible, and then you try to go tell your Christian friends, well, I, don't know, I don't know if I agree with that. Of course you don't agree with it. And you know what? You're not about to agree with it. Because it would require you to actually get in your Bible. Sure, yeah. and if you actually got in the Bible, you'd find out, well, what have I been doing all these years sitting in this church being told we're bringing in the kingdom by voting for Republicans. Or in this church being told that we're restoring the kingdom by following Martin Luther King. Come on, it works both ways. Everybody wants to fix this earth. And it ain't going to get fixed till Jesus gets back. Your assignment is not to bring in an earthly kingdom. Your assignment is to give people the gospel. Preach the gospel. Can I, can I prophesy? I'm going to prophesy. I'm going to prophesy. If Jesus doesn't come, this is prophecy, if Jesus doesn't come, whoever gets elected in November, by the following July, you'll be disappointed. Just tell, well, no, if, if my guy gets in, if your guy gets in, you'll have this big long list of things he said he was going to do. And you'll have to start tearing them off. Well, yeah. well, there went that one, there went that one, there went that one, there went that Preach the gospel. Win people to Christ. Take time out of that to go vote. Well, I don't know if there's nobody out there I can vote for. Do what I do. Vote against people. I don't like any of those guys. Well, how about those gals? This guy over here might not be everything I like, but those people over there have professed perverts. So I can vote against that. Anyway, I'm going to spend my whole life on that. I'm going to spend my life trying to get people saved. If you get somebody saved, all that other stuff, well, it's, it's, it, it'll, it'll all fall in place. It'll all take its place. So, are you God's elect tonight? <laughs> or have you believed the gospel? Yeah, amen. All right, that's the introduction. That's why you need to come Sunday night, Thursday night. We, 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 can't, we can't do this stuff Sunday morning. Y'all bring your visitors and your loved ones and your co-workers and your friends. And i got to turn on a charm. Yeah, that, that's what that was. But Sunday night and Thursday night, I can just be me. Scorched earth policy. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, help us, Lord, to just believe your Bible. And, and Father, every time we come across something in the Scripture that goes against something we've heard or felt or were told, would you help us, God, to have so much confidence in the Bible that we don't try to adjust the book to line up with what we think, but we adjust our thinking to line up with your book. Please, God, these things will work effectually in us if we'll believe them. And, and we thank you for giving us the Bible to be a lamp to our feet and light to our path. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.